So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the uh, latest Collision Hub webinar. Today we've got Ryan Marinin from 3M, and he's going to be talking about restoring corrosion protection in the age of post-repair inspections. Now, today's going to be a little bit different um, than the previous webinars that we've had. Um, Ryan's got a lot of his stuff pre-recorded, so we will be still using the chat feature. So please, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, use the, uh, the chat function on your, on your app. Uh, however, we will not be like pausing and taking questions uh, verbally. So at the end of the presentation, uh, we will have some time for questions. But for during the presentation itself, uh, just go ahead and use that chat feature. And Kristen, Ryan, Ian, and myself will be monitoring that. And we'll be able to answer uh, anything that we need to. So uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to Ryan. And uh, we'll get started. Awesome. Give me one second to get set up. We're living in a uh, big shout out to Collision Hub for allowing 3M and myself to be a part of this presentation here today and what they've been doing for the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, today, we really want to talk about restoring corrosion protection in the era of post repair inspection. And this post repair inspection has been a growing thing, uh, it's not going away, it's going to only become more and more prevalent in our industry. And we really need to make sure that we're doing all the proper things um, so that we're not, you know, A, making bad repairs, um, and B, not causing headaches for ourselves or our customers down the road. And uh, cavity wax and seam sealers are typically one of the first giveaways when somebody goes out to do a reinspection. Um, if, if anybody's ever torn a car apart at some point and noticed right away a dead giveaway is like, hey, that seam sealer doesn't match at all or look at all this rust inside here, there was no cavity wax put on, or look at all these bare exposed welds, they were never coated properly. Um, those are the kind of things that we really want to avoid. And throughout this uh, next 45 or 50 minutes here, we're gonna talk about a lot of these things. So as you have questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat. I'll try to answer them throughout this as I can. Um, I'm hoping to leave a little bit of time at the end for some Q&A, but I really wanna get, uh, you know, dive into this uh, right away. And I really want to uh, start covering, um, most importantly, what corrosion protection is to begin with, right? And so basically when we look at corrosion protection, we're looking at these three key elements. So if you look at the center of this and where we have corrosion protection listed, think of that as your repair. No matter if it's a weld, a body filler, it could be seam sealer, um, whatever repair you just fixed, um, you need these three external um, components here to really protect that repair, that replaced panel, that, that body filler, you know, that dent that we've fixed. We really want to make sure that we have these three critical elements. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, these three things here today. But what I want to point out is that, you know, most all ma uh, vehicle manufacturers, they, they really do assemble all these steel and aluminum components of the vehicle prior to any coatings being applied. So if you notice in this picture here, there, there's uh, no seam sealer, there's no e-coat at this point. Um, they're actually bolting on all of these panels. And then the next step of the process is it's going to go through a corrosion bath, right? So to get all the contaminants off of the surface, the, the mill oils and any stamping debris and any debris that it's picked up throughout the assembly process, it's gonna go through a series of these, these baths here where the, the surface is gonna get washed, it's gonna have, you know, it's gonna be degreased, um, it's gonna get a conditioner, and then it's gonna actually get e-coated. And what I wanna highlight here is, is this process of, you know, actually getting the car e-coated and what most manufacturers are doing. And this is where they're getting their optimal corrosion protection from. Again, I'm gonna reference this a couple times today is that we're really starting at the beginning. Right, and that's exactly what the OEM manufacturers are doing here is they're starting at the beginning. And as you can see in this video here, as this vehicle is coming out of like the last bath of you know washing and degreasing, it's gonna go through a drying process where they're rolling down, you know, they're all mounted on these carts and they just kind of 
travel throughout the the uh, the factory this way. And so as this vehicle is getting, you know, onto the next step of the process, you'll notice there's no human interaction at this point. It's a very clean environment. And it needs to be that way so that we're not picking up any additional contaminants before that last wash and this eco process. So as you see here, this vehicle is, you know, being fully submerged and it's being submerged in a bath. And all of these bath cycles is the, the, the bath itself is positively charged and the vehicle itself is negatively charged. And this way we get good um, surface conductivity of the materials, right? We're getting these materials are getting a good true bond to the surface this way. They're also because it's such a liquid state, it's getting in between all these weld zones. Right, so these cars are welded together, they're bolted together, and then the, the e-coat is actually being allowed to work its way in between and protect all the bare metal surfaces um, through this process. And then it's gonna go on to uh, the seam sealer deck, where seam sealers are gonna be applied, and that's a critical component of the process as well. So now we've talked a little bit about you know, the base material, and what the factories are doing for corrosion protection. We're gonna kinda, go back to yet another material that gets used on substrates. Um, and that's the topic of bare metal seam sealer. This one comes up quite a bit. Um, and what we do really need to kind of understand first and foremost is, you know, what is a bare metal seam sealer and why do we have it? And one of the things that we want to be certain of here is, is that we're using a, a seam sealer that's actually designed to be bare metal. Um, it's going to have a, a chemical corrosion inhibitor built into the product, right? These are typically a, a urethane or epoxy base. But what's most important here to point out is that these seam sealers are, exist in our industry today to try and decrease cycle times, right? We, they were driven by the industry, by, you know, the, the insurance company's demand for faster repairs, for the customer's demand to get their cars back faster. Um, for the shops to want to increase their their key to key cycle times and really what we want to point out here is that you know they're not bad seam sealers uh, but we do see some misuse with them and one of the typical areas that we see a lot of misuses or, or the reasons why you know a direct to metal seam sealer may potentially fail is due to like what we consider you know a, a lack of actual sealing at the edge of the seam sealer. Okay, so if you're trying to replicate any type of bead or, or uh, appearance and you don't get a good tight seal on that edge, you're allowing the potential for moisture to get in here. And with that, you've got to be very careful about the top coatings that we're putting on as well, right? So we weren't able to get, or in this picture here, they weren't able to get any material down inside behind that seam sealer. And this particular repair was actually something that we were called out to. This, this shop had repaired this vehicle and six months later, the customer was involved in another accident and really liked the work that the shop did the first time. So they brought their car back to them. And when they took the rear bumper off, they noticed this right away. And of course, immediately they were concerned um, and they, they were concerned that the product had failed. And, you know, by going out and taking a look at it and, and viewing it up close, we were able to determine that it wasn't necessarily the product here that had failed, that it was more so the application. And that's where the, the concern comes in with direct to metal seam sealers is we really have to be hyper focused on the application, um, not just the, the seam sealer to the surface. Uh, of the vehicle, but we have to be concerned about the top coats that we're applying on onto the surface of these as well, right? So if you're using a bare metal seam sealer, um, and especially on the edges, it's only going to be a f as effective as the coating that you're putting over the top of it, right? And so this is where I want to point out that no matter what coating it is that you're using, you know, most likely it's going to be uh, a paint manufacturer's, you know, uh, epoxy primer or a urethane coating. Um, we just want to make sure that you're always following the product manufacturer's recommendations for application. And in this case, when we're talking about paint, adequate mill build as well. We need to make sure that not only are we getting coverage on these edges, but we're also getting the proper mill build because without the proper mill build, we may not still have that corrosion resistance, even though it looks like it's been covered. So this might end up leading to a conversation that that needs to be had more often between 
the body technician, and a paint technician in these areas where they're applying bare metal seam sealers, actually going and having a conversation about saying, hey, you know what, we need to make sure that, you know, I have bare metal here. Can we make sure that we get the adequate number of coats applied to this to really provide a good corrosion resistant repair? And those are going to be very important conversations to have um, within the shop, right? Communication is going to be key here um, outside of just the application of the product because when it's not applied properly, or it's or um, you know areas tend to get missed, and this isn't necessarily just from lack of caring. Sometimes it's you can't get the paint gun on the other side, and so what we end up seeing is what we call this shadow edge, where we don't have adequate coverage of a material. And if that edge is a bare metal edge, or, or that seam sealer is a bare metal seam sealer, and now we've got a bare metal exposed edge along that sealer, that corrosion can start there. And the corrosion will build on the surface of the panel and it'll work its way underneath the seam sealer. It, it happens with panel bonds, it happens with seam sealers, it bites into the surface of the metal and it just eats away, um, inevitably causing a failure. And a lot of the areas that we see this uh, are very vulnerable to corrosion, right? Areas like door hem flanges, um, rocker panels and wheel opening moldings, or not moldings, but wheel opening areas where we have to be putting a seam sealer bead because from the factory they, they may have had it and we need to duplicate that. Or maybe they're suggesting that we put one there to make it more resistance to stone chips and so forth and corrosion. And so we really need to be sure that we're, we're getting this adequate coverage on all of these surfaces of that seam. Now this often uh, lends itself to another conversation of, you know, I hear what you're saying, um, I don't use any bare metal seam sealers, or I use a bare metal seam sealer, but I always put a primer down underneath it, and that, that to me is, is, is an excellent practice. In fact, it's 3M's best practice that all seam sealers, even direct to metal seam sealers, are put over an appropriate 2K epoxy primer. And I point out 2K because quite often we'll see a technician um, saying, you know, well, I don't put anything on bare metal because I've heard and listened to your message, but I, I need it to be faster. So I'm using a, a one component, a rattle can primer. Uh, there's several brands and colors on the market, um, and they tend to get used because they're extremely fast, right? Again, we're in a fast-paced society where everything needs to be done right now, but sometimes that need for everything getting done right now doesn't mean that we're always making the best repair. So you can see on this panel over my shoulder here, um, on the bottom half of this, we've put a 2K epoxy primer, and on the top half, we've put a 1K. And we let the technicians that come into St. Paul that, that we uh, provide training for the opportunity to build these panels. So this panel here was built by a technician and we give them a variety of products because it's not exclusive to any one brand or product, right? So for instance, this right here is actually a 3M Marhide uh, self etching primer. Um, I don't even remember what brand this is, but it's, you know, another brand that's available on the marketplace. Um, and, and overwhelmingly we run these tests quite frequently and we let technicians build them and we've even had some other outside technicians that have been through our program go back to their shops and try to build a panel in their own way and send it in and we've put it through our salt tanks and and been able to prove that it's you know it really comes down to the value of the product and in this case here a 2k epoxy primer is going to be the most corrosion resistant primer to be used um, not saying that a urethane can't be used, um, but with an epoxy, you don't need to, you know, put down the acid etch primer first. And a lot of times we see guys that will put down the acid etch and then the seam sealer and then put the urethane primer over the top of it. And we want to avoid that as well because we have um, two dissimilar chemistries working together there in the seam sealer and the, the etching primer. So we always want to avoid etching primers at all costs. Um, so as you always hear us say, you know, what are the OEMs saying? You know, we always really follow the procedures when it comes to, um, you know, structural repairs, welding and sectioning, but really they get in deeper and we need to continue reading on and, and understanding the bulletins that are available. 
And this particular one here is from Toyota. It's Crib 186. And I really like using this one because they, they really paint a, a picture that is without doubt uh, unquestionable on their statement, right? They're very clear about what it is that they want. And one of the first things that they talk about in their statement is the fact that when the e-coat is damaged, um, it needs to be replicated with a two-component direct-to-metal or epoxy primer. And they're very specific in saying an etch primer cannot exhibit the corrosion prevention characteristics of a direct-to-metal or epoxy primer and e-coat over the long term. Therefore, it is not recommended, right? So it's not recommended as a substitute for e-coat um, or a direct-to-metal epoxy primer. And so that's very important because they also go on to say seam sealers should be applied to properly prepared and primed surfaces, not directly over bare metal. And this is a very key one to point out here because, again, if you're using a um, if if you're using a 1K primer because you've read this statement here where it needs to be put over a properly prepared and primed surface then we really need to go back one step because right before that they told us what kind of primer to be used right they didn't state a 1k primer they specifically stated an epoxy or direct to metal primer so we really got to make sure that in all aspects of the repair we're following the OEM procedures and then one more thing to highlight quickly is that you know when it comes to bonding in glass um, and, and glass bonded flanges um, they're talking here that you know Bare metal pinch weld urethane should not be used. Okay, They're, they want it to be put over an epoxy primer as well. So if you're using a product that's approved for direct to metal, um, it, when it comes to primers and, and windshield urethanes, we want to make sure that we're always going to defer to the OEMs, right? They're the experts on how the vehicle was originally constructed and should be reconstructed in the event of an accident. So they're always going to supersede whatever the product manufacturer's recommendations are. At 3M, we work together with the OEMs to come up with our best practices that align with the OEMs. And that's what we're gonna dive into here a little bit more today as we go through this, uh, go through this exercise. So this is a uh, Chrysler Bulletin. It was published in uh, 2019, it was updated. This is um, their refinish repair guidelines. And I wanna highlight the bottom down here where it says you know, pre-refinish uh, repair guidelines because they also make mention of that all bare metal should be epoxy primed prior to applying seam sealer, right? They also go on to say that all hem flanges and closure panels should be sealed whether sealer is apparent or not. This includes those disturbed during the repair and those on new replacement panels. And then they continue on even one step further here, and they're talking about either duplicate the existing bead in shape or size, or one is not obvious, um, seal the hem flange in a discrete fashion. And so this is where we'll get the question of, okay, it says seal it in a discrete fashion. How do you do that? Uh, we do have some videos available on YouTube um, that will help walk you through that. But I also want to point out here, and I'm, I'm going to uh, show you a video from my, my colleagues um, where GM also has a similar call out to this just to show you that it's not exclusive to any one OEM or just a few OEMs, that many of them have very similar position statements out there. So take a look so at now, this. So now you've seam sealed here. What if there was no seam seal in here from the factory? Now I see there's some MIG welds here. So does that have an effect on whether we're seam sealing or not? Um, you know, really the best thing to do is follow what the OEM says. And we know that from looking at the OEM statements uh, that we're going to be talking about during this presentation that it's important uh, to seal even when the factory didn't have sealer in these places. So in this case, factory may, may not have had sealer in here, but you remember the factory can also put the car through a, through a tank in the e-coat process. So they're really getting uh, paint everywhere around all the welds, everything continuous. Whereas here, once I plug weld with this, these areas with the MIG, I'm going to have some hot spots that are going to cause corrosion. So I have to go ahead and seal this off, keep any kind of moisture from getting in between there. Okay, so in other words, once we've welded on a replacement panel, things get different than what they had at the factory, where we may need to seam seal regardless. We're yeah. taking extra precaution uh, and doing a little more than maybe what the factory Yeah, did. exactly, That's okay. exactly. Okay, all right. 
So what would we do on the inside of this panel? You know, that's a great question. So generally speaking, the rule of thumb is going to be to seal on the inside and on the outside of any of these joints that you form together. So in this case, we've, you know, have basically an overlap seam on the opposite side of this where this apron joins the other side of this rail. Uh, it's going to be important to seal that seam as well. We want to keep water from getting between those two panels. Okay, Dennis, now I see you've sealed the inside of that rail. Yep. There's two things I noticed. Number one, there's no seam sealer on the opposite frame right. rail. Yeah. And I noticed you put a very thin application or a very small bead on there. What was the purpose of that? So, um, again, I'm going to follow the OEM's recommendations. They're saying seal the seam, seal it inside, seal it outside, keep the water out of that joint. But I know I want to make this look nice and clean here. Um, as you said, the other side, I, I can't see the seam sealer on this. Right. But again, this car, when it was built, went through an eco bath. So we can't do that here. So the idea is that when I seal the seam, I tool it off to a nice, clean, as, as kind of radiused in and finished look as I can possibly get. Then it's a nice, clean application. When, when my painter comes back in here and does his color code application, basically this is going to be an almost invisible. Right, so you got the function where you've got it all sealed off, but it still looks very similar, especially after it's painted. It's going to look very similar to the other side where you really can't tell it's been seam sealed. Yeah, exactly. As the other side. Exactly. And that's the point of this. Yep. Seal it off, but make it look. So you see yet again another reference to what the OEMs are recommending and some best practices to ensure optimal corrosion protection. And as Sean mentioned there, you know, if there was a, a larger bead or a caterpillar style bead, um, needing to be able to replicate that. And if you're connected to us over on any of our uh, Instagram or Facebook pages, also 3M Collision Repair Academy, we have some of these videos um, to help walk you through that process and really make sure that, you know, you're comfortable using our products and replicating these OEM beads and appearances. And with that, we also have the availability of the demo board. And what this is, is a tool for you to be able to, you know, reach out to your rep or your distributor and ask them to, you know, come out and do a demonstration, right? So we've got this demo board here. Um, I've been able to train our sales force, mo most all of our sales force over this last year to bring them up to speed on how to replicate these and, and be able to go out into the shops and show you that with 3M products, we can achieve these OEM factory appearances. Because again, that's going to become crucial in, in, in a reinspection situation, right? We really need to make sure that we're getting these factory looks and appearances on these beads. So reach out to your sales rep or reach out to your distributor and tell them that you'd like to see this demonstration. Um, and these are leave behinds for you guys at the shop. So definitely a great tool there for you to access. Uh, one other thing that I want to talk about as we move into this next segment here is the use of undercoatings as part of corrosion protection. And it's important to point this out because in many cases there's locations on the vehicle where you can't apply an undercoating or there isn't an undercoating rather applied from the factory. But in the aftermarket during a repair or replacement situation, they're telling us you know, to, to replace these coatings or add these coatings. And as you can see here by the two repair procedures that I've thrown up here, this Lexus and this Infinity, they've got these areas designated. Um, so again, using these bulletins, using the repair procedures, some of this may, may or may not be included in the P pages. These are great tools to use um, during the repair uh, or the estimating process and the blueprinting process to, uh, to hopefully get a little bit more on our repair. Uh, to hope or to help better explain this, um, check out this video. I see you went ahead and undercoated in this area here. Now, what, what do we need to consider about a, an, an area in this particular application? So one of the things, Sean, I, I obviously we want to look at first of all is going to be what does the OEM say? So, I mean, undercoating is always a good practice. Now, there may or may not have been undercoating on this in the factory. In fact, in this case, there wasn't. But I know that GM is going to tell me that I need to put an undercoating on these outer panels. Now, this is a material that dries through a dry film, right? It's a rubberized material that dries dry. Uh, it's going to resist corrosion. It has a corrosion inhibitor in it, as well as it's going to stop stones from chipping through it, as long as I put enough of this material on. So I like to use about two to four coats. 
In this case, we put about three coats on here. And if I was to go four, I, I wouldn't feel bad about that because I know that more is better. It's going to resist what are the, additional, the stone chips. What do the additional coats do for you? Why so many coats? You know, that's a great question. And, and you know, I've seen lots and lots of salt spray tests where we looked at kind of a, a breaking point for where things were going to be able to prevent corrosion after 1,500 hours. And it always seemed like a dry mill thickness around 10, 10 or slightly above 10 mils was going to give you the protection you really needed uh, under really harsh conditions. And so uh, this type of material, believe it or not, has about a 50% shrink rate from a wet mill thickness to a dry mill thickness. And I've seen that across many different products uh, related to undercoating. So it's not just this particular one, but in general, that's a rule of thumb. And, and so we found if you, put, if you put four coats on, it's going to give you 20 plus mills. Now it depends on, on the settings on the gun, sure, sure. right? So, um, you know, I had some pretty, some pretty heavy coats I applied on here, but it's nice. This gun I can use low pressure. I don't have to overspray a lot. It's more convenient than an aerosol because I can paint any angle with it. So it's really kind of a handy piece to use. And, you know, it, it may, it's, it's nice clean application without a whole lot of overspray and easy to use. And thickness, are we worried about what stones will do to this area as well? Yeah, for sure. So there's going to be a, a shield in here, a fender liner, but of, of course that doesn't cover every square inch of this. So you, you're probably going to get some, some stone chipping that's going to go on and some rubbing and chafing from the fender liner and whatnot. So yeah, it, it has a purpose to resist uh, stone chips and any kind of chafing or anything from any, any fender liner or whatever that was going to go in this, in this okay. application. So thorough coverage and enough coats to build up that mill thickness are the keys to this application. Yeah, yeah. Another great spot for this, Sean, if you want to think about it, is of course this, this car was on a, on a repair bench, right? So it was on a, it was clamped in quad clamps underneath here. So there's four clamps that were holding us up on the pinch welds. And we know that that area had to be cleaned off. So um, again, that's important that you go ahead and use some undercoating. This is a paintable material, so I can go ahead and, and clean that up, dress it, scuff it, and I can put the undercoating on those areas. And when it dries, the painter can go ahead and paint uh, the color back on top of this with no problem. So uh, another great application that guys oftentimes may forget about or, or just may not get time to do. Or again, it's, you know, I can turn this gun sideways or upside down and spray with it so that that pinch weld area is a really important area to, to yeah. coat back on there too. So the rule of thumb is on the outer exposed surfaces, you're going to use something hard that dries a touch. Inside, you're going to use the tacky. Yep, that's, that's a great way to think about it. So as you can see, uh, as he mentioned, even in some of these areas where from the factory, they may not have had these coatings. If it's part of the repair procedure or the recommendations, we need to make sure that we're applying these because these are the kind of things that a re-inspector is going to potentially be looking for uh, when they go out to, to view the vehicle. And even if the other three wheelhouses don't necessarily have that coating in there, I would rather have it in the wheelhouse that I repaired because it was on the repair procedure and that I documented it, right? Again, going back to that whole documentation, sometimes this is gonna mean taking photos throughout the repair process and keeping them, keeping them with the repair order so that if there's ever a question about our repairs, um, we have that documentation readily available. Uh, and that, that saves the shop a headache, that saves the customer a headache from having to come back and potentially have their car taken back apart or having to go to another location and have somebody else you know, look at our cars. Um, but so kind of rolling off of that, that undercoatings um, video there and talking a little bit now about proper application of cavity wax. So it's important that we understand that you know, seam sealers and undercoatings need to be applied to the vehicle prior to the, the cavity wax application. Um, but there are some do's and don'ts with cavity wax as well. And Nissan highlights uh, one of these features here in, in the repair bulletin where they're talking about the recessed uh, portions of the, the body, um, the areas that cannot be easily accessed by, you know, a, a paint gun. It's important that we're only using a, you know, a cavity wax in that material or in that in those locations. Um, we don't want the material like any primers or anything being blindly sprayed into these cavities. It's important that we're using a cavity wax and, and Nissan and several others, I'm using this one in particular here, understands that and they're actually calling that out. And so to better explain this, I'm going to bring Dennis back again one more time. Take a look at this. 
Isn't it better to use epoxy primer inside of a closed cavity and sectioning location before cavity wax? Yeah, well, that, and that kind of gets at what we were just talking about. So if, if there was burn charred paint in there and I sprayed it with epoxy primer, and that kind of was the school of thought a few years back, mm -hmm. but since then it's kind of changed because if I sprayed it with, with epoxy primer, epoxy primer would dry to a dry film, right. and if it was on burn charred paint and soot, it would just flake off. Okay. So if I put cavity wax over it, it would just flake off. Okay. So the best thing you do is, is to prep the back side of the part and use just cavity wax on that area. Very and not to mention that epoxy primer is very slow, slow drying, curing, and if yep. it pools in the bottom of a rail, yep. it might be days before it's actually and, it, and it's worse to cover epoxy primer before it completely cures, because it, then it, it actually makes the whole, the whole repair start, right. the coating system start to fail. Right. So those are some great points. And like Sean mentioned in that video, the fact that, you know, having these coatings in there and potentially pooling up and blocking, you know, some of these flanges that need to have cavity wax, you know, wick into these locations um, because of the use of a primer might, might still leave bare metal in there. Um, so it's important, again, that the best application um, in blind areas, I'm thinking of like, you know, if you, if you think of a quarter panel, say the backside of a taillight pocket, those things are pretty easily accessible in most cases, you know, to get in there and clean them up and properly prepare them and then apply, you know, top coatings or paint material on top of those. But if you think of like your rocker section points or your sail panels, right? I don't know many vehicles that I've ever worked on where I've had access to those areas. And so it's important that we do the proper steps to prepare those areas prior to welding and bonding on the panels so that when we come back in at the end with cavity wax and apply it, that it's gonna do its job properly and protect those weld zones. And um, Lexus here has a very unique um, bulletin where they're talking about the use of, of cavity wax. I first wanna highlight, you know, they, you see in this image here about around the hood, the front of the hood, uh, bottoms of the doors, but I really wanna highlight this, this hinge location. Um, coming from a Lexus certified uh, repair facility out of the industry, um, these hinge locations were actually seam sealed from the factory. And what Toyota is saying here is that they want these to be cavity waxed after, you know, not seam sealed, right? So they want you to apply an anti-rust agent or cavity wax to the interior of the door, the hood, edges, and around the hinges to prevent rust. Right, so coat the interior of the rocker panels, the interior uh, edges using a nozzle and an air gun. In our case, our Cavity Wax Plus, we've got a wand kit and it's an aerosol, so it's easy and convenient for application. Um, but then around these hood hinges or, or door hinges, we wanna be using a Cavity Wax. And it's important, and the reason why I point this out is because if, I'm sure many guys have taken hoods off where they've, you know, they've got their partner helping them, they undo all the bolts and the hood's still attached to the hinges and you gotta, you kinda gotta give it that, the bump to break it loose. That's the e-coat and the sealants that they use from the factory that's wicked in and been baked into those locations to ward off any moisture um, getting into those areas, right? So it's important to also replicate that in the aftermarket and, and like I said, Toyota here, particularly in this ES model repair procedure, they're saying use a cavity wax, um, even though those hinges came uh, seam sealed on from the factory. And again, you know, it's not exclusive to just Toyota. Um, we've got a, a couple bulletins here, one from Honda, where they also have highlighted around the hood, um, around the deck lid, bottoms of the doors, the frame rails, the fenders, the subframes, the fuel door even, right? So if you take a look, they got the fuel door hinge, um, listed there. And then Subaru on the right. Now I want to, I highlight this one for a reason because 3M's best practice is that you apply three coats of cavity wax um, to your repair area. And what we're trying to achieve is 30 mils of build. And as you can see here, Subaru is actually calling for 50. And so that, that UM is, is translated from uh, Japanese to English as mils. And so that's just a, a measurement. And so they're requiring 50 mils to be used in their panel, specifically here, this door. And so if we know that with 3M cavity wax, you know, we need to have, um, we need to have 30 mils of build 
to achieve this, or, or our best practice is three coats to achieve 30 mils of build. Well, we know that if, if Subaru is requiring 50, right, then it's probably going to mean five coats with our cavity wax. And I want to highlight here the importance of, you know, a lot of times we'll hear guys say, you know, I use product XYZ because I know I've got enough in when it's running out all over the floor. And I pause there to, to, for a second because it's one of these, like, if it's all over the floor, what's inside the vehicle? What really is protecting our repairs? And especially if you're welding, say, like a rocker panel, right? What's, what's protecting the top? If you've sprayed that cavity wax in there and it all ran out and now it's dripping out all over the floor. Um, so I, I want you to be considerate to the fact that our cavity wax is actually designed to have a little bit of foamingness to it so that when you first apply it, it touches and grabs all the metal surfaces. And then from there, it's a wicking action or a capillary action that takes place to protect and coat and work its way in between these panels. So it's designed to stick to the to the walls that we're putting it on. And again, we've got some several great videos um, on 3M Collision Repair Academy and also our YouTube channel. But what I want to show you here is a kind of a cutaway of a repair that Dennis and Sean are going to apply some cavity wax to. Some best practices. So so this kind of goes back to what we saw from Chrysler where they're saying don't use anything in those in those flanges when you're welding things together, but use cavity wax. Now, if you look on the left-hand side, this was uh, a combination of, of MIG plug welding and, and spot welding. And that left-hand uh, image, uh, the number three rail there, uh, it has uh, n nothing, no weld-through coating, no seam sealer, and no cavity wax. And on the right-hand side, that image has uh, no weld-through coating, but cavity wax, and then seam sealer around the outer perimeter of of the joint. So we sealed that joint together from the outside. We yep. didn't weld through the sealer. And then we use cavity wax on the inside. And you can see that that weld flange is just pristine. And this is after 500 hours That's in the same environment that the rail on the left was in, exposed to. So uh, going back to what Chrysler and Honda were saying about uh, no, no weld through, well, you can see that as long as you seal that seam and you use cavity wax, you don't need weld. Of course, people think cavity wax, they think maybe quarter, they think door cavity. Right. What about all the other areas? Yeah, what, are, what are some of the common ones that get messed Exactly, and, and, and I think in the, middle, in the middle of this slide is probably one of the most important pieces, and that's the radiator support, or core support area. I mean, it's front and center in the vehicle, so it's one that's gonna get subjected to crashes primarily, right? You're gonna, you know, it's either rear or front, but typically those are the most of the impacts are in the front. You're gonna be welding in a new radiator support. It's gonna get welded into the upper rails and the lower rails, sure. and, and those are highly susceptible to corrosion. Once you, if you spot welder, in, in most cases, you're gonna to have to plug weld this because you can't get your spot weld tool inside those lower frame rails to do it. Here like the factory. SOPs as part of the reinspection process to protect ourselves um, in the event of a reinspection or a question about our repairs. We've actually taken it one step further um, with our SOPs just to align more strategically with the OEMs and actually pointing out taking uh, pre and post application photos and how we've done that is simply just with a you know, mobile device um, or an endoscope or a boroscope like we have here. Now there's several other, um, several of these products on the marketplace. I'm not endorsing um, this particular brand. It just happens to be the one that I acquired um, for myself. I've got a couple different ones. I've got them off of Amazon. They're relatively inexpensive. It's this scope right here. It links to my cell phone. Um, these are awesome to have for the entire repair procedure. So you can use these, you know, during your um, construction of, you know, like say welding on a quarter panel. If you need to inspect to make sure that you've got adequate burn through in, in your sail panel, that you re removed all the coatings. Um, taking photos of this stuff along the way is going to be more and more important as this industry continues to evolve because we need to really be concerned with protecting ourselves. Um, Larry's had some great videos on Collision Hub and I've seen him on CTU a few times on Facebook where he talks about documentation. I think he recently just did one where he had a stack of paperwork on his desk. Um, but we're getting to that point where we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect ourselves. Now, the last thing we want to be doing is taking a customer's vehicle back apart if there's a question, right? 
people that are doing some of these reinspections, they may not be experts. They might look at the, re, you know, the repair estimate and say, oh, it looks like they replaced their section to frame rail. They may not know where or have direct access to where you sectioned it at, so they might stick a boroscope in a frame rail in a totally different location, snap a photo and be like, I can't see cavity wax in here. Um, if that ever comes to question and you have it documented, you can say, hey, Mr. Estimator, sir, I appreciate your concern. Um, we're also concerned for the customer's you know, safety and the, and the well-being of the vehicle. We have this documentation. Please let me send this to you and show that we actually have applied cavity wax in these locations, that we have applied the proper primers, that we have matched the original seam sealer look and appearance. So um, I want to show you guys one more video here. Uh, Sean and Dennis kind of break down what they've found in um, some repairs with a boroscope going beyond, like I mentioned here, just cavity wax. They're really going beyond into the full repair process and how these things can be used um, to our advantage and hopefully not to our disadvantage. So take a look at this. What I call attention to is, is the boros, the tool, the boroscope. Yeah, you see the soot inside that quarter panel, right. for one thing. Dennis, what are your comments here? Yeah, so I mean, it's a, a simple operation to go ahead and clean, the, clean that off before you put the seam sealer on and make sure you dress all the welds. And, and I really love the idea of going on the inside of these areas because, because on the right lower portion of this slide, it looks like the boroscope exposed the fact that uh, there's some there's some burned charred e-coat. So before those panels were joined together, it would have been a really easy step to take a file belt and just uh, use a, a, a or some sort of a non-woven type of disc or whatever you want to use to clean the e-coat off so that when you did the weld, you had a clean finished area that the, the, and then put cavity wax in. So I hope that helps highlight um, some of these areas and these concerns and some of the tools that are can be used to our advantage throughout the repair process to provide a more corrosion resistant repair um, in many cases like the OEMs asking us to do. And I kind of like using this uh, picture here. It's actually an Audi sedan, um, but each color component here makes up a different um, alloy that comes, it's bonded together, welded together, riveted together, whatever it might be. But I like this because it highlights the amount of dissimilar substrates that come together to make up a vehicle, right? We've got borons, we've got high strength steels, mild steels. Um, in some cases, we're talking about aluminum and composites and, and some other things. But it's extremely important that we protect these panels from corrosion. Because again, when the vehicle was built, when the manufacturer designed and ma made that vehicle, they had it in mind that these panels would be protected so that in the event of an accident, all the airbags, all the safety features of the car would work properly. Right? If we allow corrosion to break down any one of these components or panels on this vehicle, we've essentially changed the molecular structure and the strength. And so the vehicle might not collapse properly or absorb the energy properly in the next accident. So part of you know, ensuring the safety to our customers and the performance in which the vehicle was made is we need to make sure that we're using the right seam sealers, the right undercoatings, the right cavity wax, um, and more importantly, in the right methods of, of which we recommend to provide us the best repair. And to kind of highlight you know, a lot of what we've talked about here today, um, this is a great uh, image here of, you know, of traditional repair. And I know we didn't talk today about like the MIG welding, spot welding, and weld through primer. Um, next week, Sean Collins is going to be on here to talk about uh, structural bonding, uh, adhesive bonding, and so forth. Um, so definitely tune back in for that because he's going to really dive deep into you know the OEM recommendations and so forth and how to how to build a very good, strong corrosion resistant repair from a structural standpoint. But if you look towards the bottom here. You know, we've got our best practice recommendations for acceptable substrates, um, things that you can and cannot do. But this picture um, right over my shoulder here is a very good cutaway image of a what would be a uh, best practice for a corrosion resistant repair, right? So if that black image around there is our actual, say this is like a rocker panel, cutaway of a rocker panel, Right? If we've got our cavity wax, if we've got our 2K primers, our seam sealers, and our external coatings, 
Um, we've essentially protected that as best as possible, following all the manufacturers and the product recommendations um, available to us in tech data sheets. Um, this really is going to give us the best advantage and then making sure that we document this. Again, this is the importance of this is documenting the product. So um, last week, Jason Sharton was on here and we talked about the use of crimp. Um, that ties very well into this and being able to document the material usage in the repair process because sometimes that's what it's going to come down to is how do I know which materials did you use um, so maybe sometimes it's you know taking a photo documentation of the products being you know used and just setting them up on the toolbox snapping a picture these are the products that we used for this repair um, making sure that if we're billing for it we're also using them you know in that repair process uh, adequately billing for the materials and then photo documentation of actual applications, right? So taking pictures of, you know, matching OEM beads, uh, shapes and appearances, um, making sure that we're using uh, boroscopes or endoscopes to, um, to photo the internal structural components of the vehicle. And that's just going to save not only us the headache in the event that this ever comes into question, um, but it's going to save the customer a lot of headache, right? We live in a society now where we're very busy, um, we're very high paced with the exception of COVID-19 now, you know, many of us are you know, stuck at home and, um, but we live in a fast paced society where people don't have a lot of time. And unfortunately they don't bring their cars back with a concern of, of rust or rot or whatever it may be until it's too late. So what could have been a quarter panel replacement before, maybe now they, get, they found rust but they didn't get back to you for six months and now you're replacing an inner and an outer and a floor extension and you're doing it all at on the shop's dime right you're you're essentially doing this repair for free and now you also have the owners and managers looking over your shoulder so it holds us to a higher level of accountability um, if we're documenting these throughout the repair process it, it protects us you know by documenting these types of things it protects the shop it protects the brand um, you know, the, the, your shop is a brand, right? You're, you don't want your stuff ending up on social media. And if, it, and if it does, you want it to be in a positive light. So hopefully this was a, a value to you guys. Like I said, I'm going um, try to try to answer some of these questions throughout. I'm going to hopefully highlight a few here or there um, that were talked about. And if you guys have any additional questions, um, by all means, now would be the time to uh, to toss them out there. So I appreciate you guys watching this stuff. And if you've got questions, throw them up in the chat, and I'll try to answer them here as best as I can with what we have left for time. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ryan, very much for that. Uh, we did have one question come in uh, that I'm not sure if everybody saw it, but Ryan did answer. The question was, uh, if using a 2K epoxy primer, should it be scuffed after cure before applying seam sealer? And uh, Ryan says scuffing ensures the primer is cured and provides additional mechanical e adhesion. So uh, certainly a good practice to do there. So uh, if there's any other questions, please now uh, feel free to use the chat or if you want to raise your hand, uh, we can come and take you off a of mute as well uh, if that works uh, better for you. So uh, we, got, uh, we, got, we, got, we got an expert here. So now's a great time to uh, go ahead and, and ask those questions. Yeah, and while we're waiting for a couple of those to come in, I want to just go back and touch on that epoxy primer question one more time. So quite often we get asked, you know, shops say, I don't want to tie up a booth cycle. I don't want to, um, you know, I definitely can't be spraying out in the shop. How, what are some other ways in which I can administer or apply the 2K epoxy primers? And you can simply just mix it up with a cotton dauber and brush it on and just get it out a little wider than what you're going to be seam sealing. Um, the reason for adding that additional step of, of scuffing it is it gives us the security that the epoxy primer has dried, right? You're always going to want to follow your paint manufacturer's recommendations. Um, but there's a lot of things that could go into it and that temperature and humidity and other things. So they might say, yeah, it takes 30 minutes to dry at the, you know, mill thickness of five or six mils. But if it's not up to the temperature that it's supposed to be at, it might take 45 or an hour or so. Just one, one reason, one other reason why we, you know, say, best practice is going to be to scuff it because it gives us that assurance that it's actually dried. And so whatever we're putting on top is going to stick appropriately. Great. Yeah. One of the things I want to add to that, Ryan, is, is I know you're being nice because you're a nice guy. 
Um, so <laughs> I, I don't, I don't have that same reputation. That's okay. Um, um, epoxy, 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 epoxy. And then when you're not sure, use epoxy. So, um, I think for all of our jobbers, um, you know, you know, a couple of tips I always give jobbers is I like to count them cans of cavity wax you're selling to a shop and then divide that by the number of technicians. Um, and then epoxy, How, you should be delivering gallons of epoxy to body shops. And most jobbers tell me they may take one gallon a year. Um, yep. I'm a rattle can fan. Sure, we all are. But rattle can doesn't really belong over on the body. So well, art it, stuff. Yeah, it epoxy. wasn't. It's not that they're bad products, right? It's just that they get misused. Right. So we see them being used as like a base material and they're actually used for like jamming operations, right. To do some quick touch-ups in trunk compartments or engine compartments. They're meant to be put over 2K products. Um, and it, depending on where you fall on that fence line, me personally, I don't, I don't feel that they belong in a body shop period. I'm kind of with you on that, Kristen, but to be fair, right. There is a place in which they're intended to be used. And a lot of times it's just misuse is what we see. Yeah. Yeah, you're the nice guy. And some of it, quite honestly, and I've I've made I've made some I've made some very interesting frenemies over it, um, <laughs> is is just bad marketing. There are companies out there that have slapped OEM approved stickers on rattle cans and and it's just and it's misled technicians. I mean, they just it just has misled them. And there's point blank, there's no other way around it. So And that's again, if you're following the OEM procedures and the bulletins, um, Honda's got a new one out there where they call out the specifically the fact that you have to use an epoxy primer underneath not only just seam sealers, but all refinished coating materials. Right. So we're talking undercoatings and gravel coatings and these other coatings as well. It's all in the same position statement. Um that just came out. So if you're a Honda shop or, or, you know, working on a Honda vehicle, make sure you pull that bulletin. Cause yeah. again, making sure we're following these bulletins and documenting that and using that to our advantage is going to really protect us throughout the repair. Yeah. Epoxy, epoxy, epoxy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> zinc well through primer. That's zinc well through primer. I mean, I, There's a reason why it's a zinc uh, phosphate bath. It's yeah. Not, I, it's I made not a I copper a phosphate thing. bath. It's a zinc. Yeah, we're not washing cars in copper. So no. yeah, I'm sorry, Jason. <laughs> No, I was just going to say, Kristen, can you go back? You posted about, you know, notice it's zinc versus copper and maybe just explain a little bit why you posted that. Um, go ahead. If you yeah, want to so, touch on that. <laughs> so I still find these, I still find these products and I can't believe it's 2020. There's so many things that I can't believe it's 2020. I can't believe an OEM still has to put out a statement against clipping. Um, I can't believe we're still not reading OE procedures, but then I go back. I can't believe it's 2020 and, and one, I guess I can't say we're still selling it because I mean, I'm sure there's a market application for it, but I can't believe I imagine any jobber selling copper weld through primer to a collision repair center with a decent conscience whatsoever. Um, so there's just no way to use it. Um, and that's why, you know, when, when you notice the, the, you know, the e-coat, the corrosion bath, it's a zinc bath. Yeah. So, I mean, if we <laughs> well, and some of it too comes down to, you don't know what you don't know. So commonly, whether it's Sean or I or, or some of the other guys from 3M, when we go out in the field and we start having these conversations, you see the light bulbs go off and, and it's, guys are like, uh-oh, you know, what happened? And in some cases, in many cases, it's not that you were intentionally making a wrong repair, right? We want to point that out. You're, you only know what you know. And our job here is what we try to do. And Kristen, what you guys and you and Jason try to do is just educate the masses as quickly as you can to what these best practices are and, and nothing says it better than just follow the OEM position statements, right? Follow the OEM procedures. Cause it's, it's written right there. They, they yep. lay it out for us. Yep. Got a couple questions that came in, Ryan. Um, one um, is, is this webinar available for replay? Yes. And, and I saw where Casey uh, got the answer in there to that as well. Um, the other question is, can I use 8115 as a seam sealer over bare metal? I don't know why you'd want to use it over as a seam sealer. It's not as flexible as a seam sealer. It's designed to be as a panel bond. So between the two panels and then also incorporate a mechanical fastener within that, right? So there's going to be squeeze type resistance welding. There might be hem flange. So it's hammered over and there's your mechanical. Could be a rivet bond situation. So I don't recommend the use of, of the seam sealer as, or, or sorry, the 8115 as a seam sealer. Um, we'd rather that you properly prep that area and apply an appropriate seam sealer for the repair. Um, one of the other questions, is there a poster, um, I, I guess can even be bought or printed uh, in, in one of the sidebar on that question, Ryan, I think you might want to address what 
3M does have available for print. Um, you know, you don't always have to wait for a rep to come by and hand you something. You can go to the website and print a lot of SOPs and things off. But anyway, sidebar, um, is there a poster that a customer can hang up for their body text that shows seam sealer recommendations with part numbers? Yeah, so there is a product chart available that has more in-depth information. So I showed you a picture of the demo board. We do have a product chart that describes the different seam sealers and some recommended uh, areas in which they need to be applied. Um, so we do have some of that information on there and we are actually actively right now, we have been for a little while updating all the information on our website to reflect a lot of this stuff with seam sealers, panel bonds, cavity waxes, recommended usage and areas in which the product should be used. Yeah, if you go to that 3mcollision.com site, there's a lot of, I think, and, and my navigation will be off, but if Ian or somebody can help correct me through it, um, there's a way to navigate to SOPs. Yeah, and those so are under, under resources. Okay. So you go down to resources and then it's uh, uh, recommendations and repairs. And then you can pull up an entire list of just SOPs by repair operation. And those are and printable. You download yep, them and as those are printable. Yep. And yep. so it's not necessarily waiting to order or have somebody nope. hand you. You could download that PDF, walk into Office Max and print those off your technicians as well. Yep. Yeah. If it's available on the website at the bottom. So when you go into like the product pages at the bottom, there should be some information and, and uh, cell flyers and so forth. So like the HGP gun and there's some videos available. Um, yeah, certainly you guys can, you know, those are printable and you can have them posted up around your shop. I also, I think Office Depot makes this really cool wall hanger that goes on your wall and it's like single, it's, it's plastic, almost like the RO sleeve that you hang from the rearview mirror, but it puts them in a flippable format so that you can bolt that to your wall and go, here are our SOPs. Yep. And then they're constantly protected. You don't have to worry about them getting dirty or anything happening to them. Yep. I just put a link up there to the, uh, to the website. Oh, perfect. Perfect, thank you. Uh, another question here. Uh, sometimes logistics of a body tech is difficult because they don't have spray guns and the epoxy primer usage is so highly regulated in the paint shop. What are some workarounds? So like I mentioned before, um, if you have a PPS liner, you can use like the midi or the mini liners and then you can just put it on a scale. So you can actually bill it through your, your mixing scale, or your, your estimating system, and then just stir it up and then apply it with a windshield cotton dauber. Um, we've talked to several of the paint manufacturers and, and said, is this an appropriate uh, method of application? They said, absolutely. You know, we typically want two to three coats being applied with a flash time in between each coat so that we get the adequate amount of mill build. Um, but that's, that would be the best application in areas where you're, you're not wanting to tie up booth space or you can't spray out in the shop, which I don't, I mean, there isn't really anywhere you can spray out in the shop if, unless you got proper ventilation and our system for it. So. Yeah, and then keep in mind some of that for you shop owners goes back to your estimators. So when we talk about logistics of repair, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about how your estimator has to think through the steps of the repair beyond just, I'm going to put a quarter panel on a car, but what are the other steps? And then do there need to be estimated times for those logistical moments? I mean, sometimes if the epoxy application means it's got to go over to the paint department and then come back to the body tech, then so be it. Um, if that's the proper way to fix the car, but if you identify those logistical steps up front and quantify that time on your estimate, then it makes that process a whole lot easier through the shop. Um, Jason, do you see that other big question? In the yeah, I do. Um, David, why don't you, um, if you could send me an email at jason at collisionhub.com and uh, I'll pass it along to uh, Ryan and team and see if we can get that answer for you offline. Any other questions before we uh, depart? Um, so first and uh, foremost, I guess as we, as we conclude, um, thank you, Ryan, once again, uh, for another fantastic presentation. It's always a pleasure uh, working with Ryan. He's a heck of a subject matter expert, and it's always been uh, been a pleasure working with him, uh, even though some might think he's got the most punchable face in collision repair. Uh, the, the world's most punchable face. Okay, okay. Most, okay. You gotta get you gotta, it right okay, if you okay, Jason, it. you gotta explain that one. There's 126 people listening. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let Ryan take that one because it's his baby, but I just think it's fantastic. So it's uh. <laughs> 
So I'll just give you the real quick gist of the story. So the, the content, the videos and stuff on YouTube, um, I hardly ever go and read the comment section, but for whatever reason, one night I got an alert for one of the videos that had been posted weeks earlier and somebody went in and, and took the time to make a very thorough descriptive explanation of what they thought of my video and ended it with the fact that I have the world's most punchable face and that 3M should definitely fire me. And then they concluded by saying thank you. So it was, it was, it was a very, if, if you're connecting me on social media, it was something that I posted on my own personal page late one night. And I got up the next morning. I was like, oh my God, there's a lot of people that were up late also seeing this. So I do want to let you know that Larry is very upset that you have taken the most punchable face title from him. <laughs> well, I, I'm, up for any, I'm up for a competition. So if Larry wants to create something, uh, some new content that would regain that title. I mean, yeah, can, don't, don't challenge him for Back that. and forth there. <laughs> I'll on that one. So I will also say that if you go to the 3M YouTube channel and watch, um, they will find you making a cameo appearance as a technician in a oh, video right. from a couple of years ago. Yep. So, yep. We did the, so, uh, the abrasives video for Cubitron 2. That's right. I forgot about that one. That was, yeah. uh, that was, that was back cool. when you were working in the shop and the that was, and video production crew just took over your shop for a day. Pretty much. Yeah. They came in uh, two weeks prior and said, we want to film this video. And they snapped a picture of me and they walked away. And two weeks later, they showed up with a semi truck load of stuff and said, Oh, by the way, you're not going to do anything today except help us film this video. So <laughs> it was fun either way, but uh, yeah, that was, that was quite a, that was 2016 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, It's been a while. Yeah. It popped up as one of my videos to monitor the other day. And I was like, Oh, look, look at there. <laughs> so, awesome. So, all right. right <laughs> so, although, although he may not be pleasant on the eyes, uh, he certainly has got a lot of expertise and I would definitely encourage you. Um, Ian had posted a couple of times there, the, uh, the, the 3M collision repair YouTube page. Definitely go check that out. Uh, there's a great bunch of great videos from Ryan and Sean and others on there. Um, on seam sealer application and other corrosion protection issues. And then also we did a, uh, a Technician 20 group meeting uh, with 3M uh, last fall sometime with Ryan and Sean. That's on the Collision Hub YouTube page. So definitely check that out if you get a chance as well. Some, uh, some outstanding content there from our friends over at 3M. So um, if there are no questions with that, I do want to thank again 3M for their continued support and uh, your time this afternoon. And we will be back this afternoon, Kristen, at... I uh, had it up here now uh, with Kaiser oh, compressors. Yeah. Three o'clock with Kaiser. Michael Camber will be in here. Um, and we're going to be talking about uh, the important, not only just the care and maintenance of your compressor, no matter if you've got a, you know, rotary screw or, or a traditional piston compressor, no matter what you have, we're going to talk about maintenance for that. Uh, but then we're also going to talk about why clean air is so important, not just on the refinishing side of the business, but on the body. So some things you may not know about compressors. So, cool. So we will see you hopefully in about 90 minutes. All right. Until then, uh, again, thanks to 3M and uh, have a great afternoon.